southeast kingdom of Vermont. Thank you. And uh, thank you for making such a long trek down here. Uh, and Brittany is proof living that all of the brilliant young scientists in the <clears throat> environmental genetics field don't come from the University of Massachusetts. The University of Vermont has uh, uh, an active program, which I think has been in, actually predates the UMass program. Right, and uh, I happen to know from the research we did that this uh, type of research is spreading across the uh, New England universities, <coughs> University of New Hampshire, and University of Maine, joined in a consortium to work together at the Isle of Shoals on marine uh, genomics. And by now, everybody knows what genomics means and uh, how we go about it. But one more example today. Uh, Brittany grew up in western Pennsylvania, stayed there to go to college at Washington and Jefferson, and during her undergraduate years had an opportunity for an internship with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in the, on the eastern shore of Maryland, and then from there, the University of Vermont for her graduate studies. And she'll tell us more details about that. And without further ado. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for inviting me here today. I am very excited to share my research. I work with uh, red spruce here in Vermont, and I use a lot of tools in my toolbox to ask some really cool questions, but one of them uh, is genomics. So, Bill, thank you for the very nice introduction. I will skip over this pretty briefly. I come from Pennsylvania <laughs> and did a lot of work in ecology while I was an undergrad. And it was the first time that I really became fascinated with understanding how uh, plants live in the environments that they do and where are, we, where are they found and what are the factors, both living and not living, that controls uh, where they're located. And then I joined UVM in 2015 as a master's student uh, looking at climate adaptation in red spruce, which I'll talk to you about today. And as I started as a master's student, I quickly got hooked to the research and transitioned to the PhD. Uh, and that's the work that I'm currently uh, working on. So what, do, what does a year um, in my life look like? I do a lot of field work. So this involves going out to the forest and taking little cuttings of red spruce needles. Uh, we collect cones from the canopy of the trees, which involves uh, slingshots and long uh, sticks with pulleys, if you will. Uh, it's super challenging, but when you actually get the cones to fall from the tree, it's very uh, rewarding. And so I take the needle tissue and the cones back to UVM. We grow a lot of red spruce seedlings, which you can see uh, in that photo there. Um, we've learned a lot of ways not to grow red spruce seedlings, and we've learned what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and we take the, with the needle tissue from these seedlings as well as the samples in the tree, I extract DNA. So I do a, a little bit of molecular work in the lab as well. Um, and then the smallest picture actually is uh, a list of sequences uh, from DNA. And I spent the most of my time on the computer. Uh, so I, I actually don't know why I put it as the smallest picture, but that's where a lot of my time is spent, is analyzing what these sequences are actually uh, telling us. So I'm a part of the Keller Lab at UVM, uh, and I think generally we have a broad umbrella of trying to understand the genetics of forest trees and invasive species. Um, and we're looking at the interaction between genomic variation in the genome and how that relates to natural populations with regard to changes in the environment. So these changes in the environment could be with climate or with biological in invasions, and that's where we mainly focus. Um, what would be a biological invasion? Uh, like the introduction of an invasive plant uh, to the community and seeing how the, that introduction can shift um, the population that's already there. So uh, we work with three different uh, study systems, poplar, spruce, and knapweed, which is also known as centoria, and I'll of course be focusing on spruce today. So I'm not going to harp on the discovery of DNA for too long, uh, but in 1950 DNA was discovered, and I think 
it goes without saying that it was one of the most fascinating groundbreaking discoveries that we've made uh, in the past um, hundred years or so. It has inspired a lot of different fields um, of biology. This picture is hard to see, but it actually inspired a Halloween costume of mine. And I find that people just love DNA, including myself. And so it's a very simple structure, if you, if you want to get to the nuts and bolts of it, of two strands that form a double helix. And on those strands, we have four chemicals, which I will, I will call nucleotides or base pairs uh, throughout this talk. And these are just the A, T's, G's, and C's, the building blocks of that DNA. So after that discovery, uh, it was, okay, well, we found out what DNA was. Well, what does it do? How does the cell actually read DNA? How do we get to proteins? Um, and then it became sequencing and understanding what one gene does, and then it turned into a few genes. And then now we're at the point where we're sequencing the entire genome of organisms. So genomics involves the sequencing and the analysis of the total content of, a, of the total co DNA content of an individual or the genome. And right now we're at the point where genomes are really large, but the sequencing technology is not good enough where we can just kind of feed a whole chromosome into the sequencer and get a very long string of base pairs back. So we have to cut the genome into a lot of small pieces, often this is millions or billions of pieces that the sequencer can then read. And then it becomes the job of stitching these sequences back together to construct the entire genome. Uh, we've come a long way, uh, but a lot of work goes into under to getting these, uh, the DNA sequence and then also understanding what the sequences mean. So which part are genes and what do these genes do are some very basic questions that we ask uh, with this field. So just to put this into a uh, temporal perspective, so we have DNA uh, being discovered in 1950. And not even by uh, the year 2000, we sequenced the first uh, genome of a small bacteria, followed by E. coli. In 2000, we have the draft version of the human genome sequenced. For plants, we sequenced the uh, mustard cress, otherwise known as Arabidopsis thaliana, and this is a huge resource for the plant community today, followed by fruit flies, mice, and then in 2003, we had, had, we had a finished um, representation of the human genome. So over a very short time period, in my mind, we've come a very long way with sequencing uh, a lot of different organisms. We've started with organisms that you can easily bring into the lab. They're called model organisms, where they're relatively small, they have short generation times, and the genomes are uh, relatively easy to characterize and pretty tiny. But where are we uh, today? So I came into graduate school having all this technology already in place for me, and someone once told me we're in this era where you can pretty much pick your favorite organism and have it sequenced, which was quite amazing. And one of the ways that this has really um, improved is with next generation sequencing. So before we were sequencing one individual at a time, maybe two, um, we weren't that limited, I should say, a handful of individuals or samples. But now we can make what I like to call DNA soup. So we can actually go out into the forest and sequence hundreds of individuals at one time. And I want to talk about how this works briefly here because I'm going to touch upon it in a little in a little bit of, uh, in my talk. So if we have tree one and we have its entire genome, we're going to cut that genome into a lot of small fragments. And what we do is we attach little identifiers or barcodes to each of those fragments. And that identifier is just the string of nucleotides or base pairs. So your A, G, T's and C's that provide a very unique combination for that particular tree. And then we go and do the same exact thing for another tree, and then another tree, and another tree. So all of our trees have a different, unique identifier. And we put all that together into what I like to call DNA soup, and that is what gets sequenced on uh, next generation platforms. So all of these little tiny fragments that we can see here in the blue, the red, and the green get attached to what's called a flow cell and we end up making a lot of uh, replicates of each of our fragments, and they form these little clusters. And then how we actually sequence the DNA is so on each of our fragments, 
On the left here we have our fragment. It's hard to see, but we have the letters of the, uh, the base pairs and the nucleotides. And so to this flow cell, we add in a mixture of DNA polymerase, which is an enzyme that makes DNA or creates DNA, and a whole bunch of free-floating nucleotides. So a lot of A, G, Ts, and Cs floating around on this flow cell. And to each of those nucleotides, we have a little fluorescent light. So whenever DNA synthesis adds that nucleotide to that strand, we see a light being emitted, and that's what the computer actually picks up on. So in this example here, that first base, base pair is an A. So what's DNA polymerase is going to attach a T nucleotide to the complementary strand, and a blue light is going to be emitted. And then as we go down in this uh, next example, an A is attached, and then an orange light is emitted. So at any point in time, you can take a screenshot of this flow cell and see what lights are coming up. You know what uh, nucleotide that is and what samples they belong to. And that's the DNA, or that's the data that we get back. So to kind of put this into perspective with regards to my study system, the human genome size is around 3.2 billion uh, DNA base pairs, which is pretty large. But conifers have 20 billion DNA base pairs. So it is a massive genome. And we've come a long way with both of these uh, uh, species, if you will. So for spruce, uh, the white spruce uh, reference genome was created in 2013 and then again updated in 2015. So spruce has 12 chromosomes and we're not at the point where we have our DNA in broken up into chromosomes. We have fragments that are longer than what we're actually sequencing. They're stitched together a little bit, but they're not put together um, in chromosomes just yet. So branching off of what genomics is generally, uh, I'm a part of a field called ecological genomics that seeks to understand the genetic mechanisms underlying responses of an organism to their natural environment. And as I mentioned before, this is like putting an entire forest into a test tube. And it's pretty remarkable to think that you can go out into the field, sample hundreds of trees, extract their DNA, and all that amounts to is a few drops of liquid in that test tube, which is very hard to see. And it's really fascinating, but it's almost very anticlimactic whenever you're doing all this work. You think you're gonna see something at the end of it, and you, it's just literally microliters of clear liquid. Uh, and it's not until you get your sequences back, your strings of A, G, T's, and C's, that you actually see what the data are telling you. So this field uh, becomes particularly important when climate and the environment starts to change. And we know that the environment, the climate changes naturally over um, historical periods, but that change has been pretty slow. And organisms have had time to evolve and adapt to their new environments because they simply had the time to do so. And this is particularly important with trees who can't just get up and move to a new area. So this diagram here uh, represents uh, data from spruce pollen that was collected. And it shows that as the glaciers were retreating, spruce started to migrate northward and also higher to elevations. But what happens when you start really rapidly changing the system? These are things like emerging diseases, species invasions, and climate change. And I am, of course, focusing on climate change. So to put this all together, um, what are some of the basic questions that we can ask through combining genomics, climate data, and conservation? So generally, I think genomics has a really true benefit in providing a deeper knowledge of climate adaptation in species. So that doesn't just have to be trees. We can actually look to see what genes are influencing particular traits that, important, that are important in relating to climate. And this can be applied to optimizing uh, climate agroforestry, so biofuels, knowing what alleles do what can really help uh, make selecting and breeding trees um, a lot easier. And this can inform restoration efforts. And generally, we can understand different demographic and evolutionary processes that shape a species population. So every evolutionary uh, change that has happened gets recorded in that genome. And we're able to look at the variation in the genome to help answer questions of why is this species here, or this population here, why is this population not here, or in a different area.
So up until this point, I've talked a lot about forest trees in general, and I haven't really specified um, any particular species. And I put this slide up here because oftentimes when we think of diversity and trying to understand why diversity is important, we think across species and we think often to the extremes of this tree or this plant really likes really arid or dry climates and this plant can really thrive um, in warm, wet climates or this one can thrive in uh, cooler climates. But it's also important to consider that there is uh, variation within an individual species and that is at the heart of my question. So not to get political in, in any way, uh, but there is a quote that says, I mean, if you've looked at 100,000 acres or so of trees, you know, a tree is a tree, how many more do you need to look at? And that fundamentally goes <laughs> against my research and what I believe in, and I think a lot of what a lot of naturalists believes in, believe in, and that all trees are not the same, and there is a lot of variation to be had within a single species. And that is what genomics allows us to uncover. So how do we actually get this variation uh, in this species? So this is the process through natural selection, where individuals that have traits that confer some sort of advantage that allows them to survive and reproduce uh, are going to be favored in a particular environment, and those that don't do so well are not going to survive and reproduce. So I made this cartoon example here where we have a gradient. The warm color represents warm uh, hot temperatures and the cooler color or the blue color represents colder uh, climate. And then I put a bunch of trees along this gradient. And I want to show here that the colors represent the phenotypes, so the traits that we can actually see or measure. And then attached to each tree, I just put a genotype. So this is a very simplified version, but this is saying at any like one point along the genome, this individual has two T nucleotides and another individual has two A nucleotides. And this is just to show that the genotype and the phenotype are directly related. So in this example, we have trees scattered along the elevational gradient, or sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, not necessarily elevational gradient, just a gradient of warm to cold. Um, and the yellow trees, for example, can grow really quickly. They do really war well in warm temperatures and they may like to have longer growing seasons. So they might start to grow earlier in the spring and they might set bud or stop growing later in the fall. And the cold um, or the blue trees are what I'm showing here is exactly the opposite. They may grow slow, they may do really well in cold climates and they might have a shorter growing season where they start growing later in the spring and stop growing earlier in the fall. Well, selection is like, it's a, natural selection is a process and it acts through various agents. So I'm using climate here as my agent of selection. So climate is not going to favor, or uh, I should say individuals are not going to do well in climates that don't suit their phenotypes, that reflect their genotypes. So over time we see, we see my red X's here represent death we see individuals starting to die out from the populations and those that survive are those that are adapted and do well in that particular part of that environmental gradient. So it's hard to see here, but what we're starting to see is a, is a cline or a gradient of phenotypes and genotypes in the environment where we have our yellow uh, trees that uh, do warm or do well in warm temperatures and have a longer growing season found more so in the warm environment, and the trees that grow slowly but do really well in cold environments are more towards the cold part of the environmental gradient. So this takes a lot of time in order to find uh, this sort of pattern, and uh, species are adapted to historical climate, but they can respond, of course, to really recent climate as well. But over time, as the individuals reproduce, they, they live, they just do their thing, we really start to see this shift in the gradient, and it's more pronounced on the landscape. And I put this triangle up here just to uh, hit upon the point that the landscape reflects three, what we see on the landscape when we see a tree reflects three different things. It's the interaction between the environment, the phenotype, and the genotype. So the environment structures and selects for particular phenotypes that do really well in that environment. And that phenotype reflects the genetics or the genome that's underneath the hood that we can't see.
So what does this mean in light of climate change and uh, environmental change in general? So we have this diversity that's maintained. So here again we have our gradient of uh, trees adapted to different environments. And the reason why we have this is because selection acting through climate is different across this gradient. So, so selection, again, allows populations to adapt to their particular environment. And this, in turn, leads to <laughs> diversity in the phenotypes we see in the landscape and the genotypes that we see in the landscape. So we no longer just have uh, a mix of individuals with traits that uh, don't really do well in any one environment, but now we have this gradient of really cold adapted trees, really warm adapted trees, and then some in the middle. And this can act as an insurance policy when the environment starts to change pretty rapidly, or even slowly for that matter. So if everyone was the same, and say we had a really uh, hot winter, and the trees couldn't maintain or withstand that hot temperature, everyone has the potential to die in like a very extreme case. But if you have some variation, which natural selection allows us to have, and it's maintained, some of those individuals might actually be able to survive. And then they're favored in the following environments if that temperature was to remain uh, really warm. So now to my, uh, to my research. And I work with red spruce, as a lot of you know, and I mentioned before. Uh, this species is found across the eastern uh, North America with the highest point that we know of in New Brunswick and the lowest point in Tennessee. And you'll notice here that the core of its range is in New England. And then we have these really isolated populations along the south. And I'm going to touch upon why that is uh, in a little bit. But this species, regardless of where it's found in its range, is a really cool, uh, adapted species that loves colder climates and moist environments. And a few species, or I should say many species, uh, depend on mature red spruce ecosystems. So I only have a few examples here, and these are from uh, areas such as Virginia and West Virginia. But red spruce forests provide one of the sole habitats for the nor northern flying squirrel in Virginia. And then there are other organisms such as salamanders, snowshoe hares, and different types of birds that also really rely not only on red spruce, but kind of the ecosystems that they create. So red spruce decline. So it's not necessarily a happy story, but there is some light at the end of the tunnel, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in a bit. So the decline um, comes in some different waves. So as I mentioned before, red spruce is sensitive to warming temperatures. So we're actually seeing that it, do, it does pretty well with a little bit of warming currently. But hundreds of years ago, when the climate started to warm and even naturally, uh, with, say, a two degrees Celsius increase in temperature, the populations naturally just started to decline in abundance. It can't withstand a lot of warm temperature. So we see this historical decline and fluctuations with warming temperatures. Then red spruce went through a round of very heavy logging, and this was done throughout its entire range. Yes? <clears throat> Where does uh, air pollution come in with uh, schools? It's my next point. Okay. Yep. So uh, heavy logging throughout its range. A lot of it was done uh, in New England, but um, I, would, I would argue probably, I don't have any facts on this, so maybe I shouldn't say it, but from the literature that I read, it seems like it was very heavy in the south. And that's why we have these sky island populations, because logging and fire both played a role in basically eliminating the spruce forest in the lower elevations, because it can tolerate some temperate climates, and now they're just uh, basically pockets at the top of the, of the mountain ranges. And then here's what you're bringing up with atmospheric pollution. So we had a massive decline of red spruce across New England because of atmospheric deposition or pollution. So how this uh, kind of works is when we have a lot of acidity in the precipitation that we're getting that comes into the soils and it shifts the soil chemistry, and I'm not a chemist by any means, but this part at least I understand a little bit. So the chemistry shifts in such a way that calcium becomes depleted. And calcium is very important for any plant that overwinters and being able to maintain 
uh, kind of like an internal homeostasis to withstand the really cold temperatures and any potential ice formation. So if you can't take a, as much calcium, your membranes aren't as stable in your cells and ice is more likely to form and you're not going to be as what we call cold tolerant. So what results is that your needles, your first year needles become really red and really hard and you may have seen this around the landscape. Um, and so that's just an event of one year of damage. But that damage adds up over time and the damage was across the entire landscape. So the, we went through this massive decline of red spruce, uh, I would say 1960s to 1980s. Um, and I'll touch upon this a little bit later, but we are starting to see a recovery, which is, is hopeful and promising for a species that seems to you know, take a lot of punches. Uh, there are a few programs uh, and initiatives that have started uh, to work towards red spruce restoration. Uh, the first one being the Central Appalachian Spruce Restoration Initiative, which was started in 2007. And then a follow-up uh, looking at the Southern Appalachians was started a bit later. So there, uh, there is some research looking in uh, restoring uh, red spruce populations to what they were in the South and also maintaining that ecosystem that a lot of these uh, organisms depend on. So where do I fit um, and where do my questions fit um, with regard to uh, conservation, genomics, and climate change research? So a lot of the climate models predict that we are going to see warming in Vermont in the not, no, not so far future, um, but it's still largely unknown how forests are going to respond. A lot of times we think of forests as uh, groups of trees acting and responding in the same way, but we know that that's not always the case and that each species can have their own story. And it's not known how red spruce is going to respond, particularly because the species went through such decline. We're seeing a little bit of recovery, but we're not sure what that long-term trend is actually going to look like. Understanding climate adaptation in a forest tree um, it's not necessarily new, but using genomics um, and answering the questions that I am at the spatial scales that I am, which I'll talk about, um, really lends to this newly forming body of literature. So for my first question, uh, the, the question is, is red spruce adapted to different environments over very short spatial scales? And by spatial scales, this is when I'm referring to uh, like an elevational gradient, where it's less than a kilometer of difference between uh, as far as that you know you can walk um, to the top to the bottom and I'm going to do this in two different ways looking for signatures of local adaptation in the genome so this is the genomic side of thing and then I also use a common garden or a private provenance provenance trials uh, to look at differences in ecologically important traits so in order to look at local adaptation that largely structures the genome and uh, is an evolutionary process, but it's an evolutionary process that does not act on its own. There are other things, other processes that can influence adaptation to a particular environment. And one process is gene flow. And gene flow you can think of as just the movement of genetic material around a landscape. So for trees, this is through uh, pollen and or seeds. And Dispersal acts as a way to just constantly mix the gene pool in an area. So anytime a pollen or a seed is released, you're adding genes to a gene pool that can potentially start the next generation. And it's important to understand where those genes are actually coming from. So this has the potential to uh, interact or impede adaptation if gene flow is just so pervasive across the landscape and this balance is particularly important at fine spatial scales because forest trees, as we know, have very long distance of dispersal. So the pollen can travel in many ways across the elevational gradient to not just stay locally within, say, low elevation climates or low elevation habitats, but they can travel to mid and to the top of the mountains. Um, and also, we have a lot of research that shows local adaptation to environments with trees already, but these just happen at very broad spatial scales. So we have some evidence that say across the range, trees uh, 
grow earlier and set bud later in warm climates, say in Tennessee. Or we, and we have trees that don't grow as long in really cold climates, say in New Brunswick. But that's a lot of space in between those two areas. And gene flow, the genetic movement, is not going to be happening at such a large spatial scale. But when you condense that to an elevational gradient, it's probably very easy to have gene flow mixing up that gene pool, making it really hard to see adaptation. So this question asks a really important question of how local is local in a way? Like what is the scale of adaptation? <coughs> and I've kind of talked about this already, but when looking at natural selection, um, elevation, which is nearly directly linked with climate in this case, really acts as a strong selective agent. So again, this is going from the warm to cold uh, gradient. So we have vegetative phenology. So this is the growing season. When did the trees start growing and when do they stop? And this is probably the most well-documented example of an adaptation we have in forest trees. We have differences, we have reproductive phenology. So when is pollen released and when are the cones receptive? Uh, we're looking into differences of those. We have differences in growth patterns, so we know that the trees in the low elevations are really, or I shouldn't say really tall, they're a lot taller than the trees in the high elevations. And then we have differences in cold tolerance, where the trees in low elevations have to withstand cold temperatures because they do overwinter, and it does get cold in Vermont. But that might be different than how cold it is at the top of the mountain in the climates that they're experiencing there. So to do this, uh, our sampling design includes looking at two different mountains. So we chose Camel's Hump and Mount Mansfield, and these act as biological replicates. So on each of our mountains, we uh, parse the elevational gradient into three different zones. We have low elevation, which is anything less than 750 meters. We have a mid elevation, which is a 100 meter span. Uh, from 750 to 850 meters, and then we have the high elevation forests, which really are spruce fir forest above 850 meters. And then within each of these elevations, we collected needle tissue from two different groups. So we collected needle tissue from trees. I'm calling them trees. They're just uh, more, uh, they're older trees, presumably, that are greater than two centimeters diameter at breast height, which is a common way to measure how big a tree is. We collected 45, um, we collected tissue from 45 trees per elevation, and then we did the same thing but for what we call juvenile. So those are the really small uh, spruce that aren't necessarily in the canopy. They're somewhere in that mid, low to mid canopy range. And we also collected cones from uh, eight maternal trees uh, per elevation. So for the genomic work, uh, it's kind of tedious uh, when you first start off. So we have our cutting of red spruce, which is maybe no longer than my finger, and you pluck needles off, and then you sit there and you chop the needles, which sounds like it sounds. Yeah, it's, it's something. So you chop the needles up, and you remember you know exactly what tree that belonged to, and you put it in a, its own tube. You extract the DNA. And then we go through that process that I mentioned at the very beginning, where I, I cut up that DNA for each individual tree species or tree into many small fragments, attach that identifier, and then make my DNA soup, and that's what gets sent to the sequencing. So in the lab, we do everything up until the sequencing. We send that off to Cornell. We actually have a facility at UVM that does that as well. And then what we get back, uh, which is hard to see in this picture, is strings of letters, A, G, T's, and C's. And we match those samples up to a reference genome, which we use white spruce, so we are able to stitch together our genome in such a way. And we look for differences in single nucleotides or single base pairs across our samples. So for example, what individuals have an A at this particular site and what individuals have a T. And we call those, I think I mentioned it before, single nucleotide polymorphisms. That's a mouthful, so you'll often hear them called SNPs. So just to put some numbers on the board, uh, I think I mentioned before that we, you get a lot of data that, uh, a lot of data goes into the sequencer, but you also get a lot of data back. And this is where, again, you spend a lot of your time. 
So I have a total of 844 samples, around 270, 280 for my three uh, life stage cohorts. And I extract the, the DNA in what we call a library. So each library has 96 spots. So I have 96 trees in one plate that gets sent to a sequencer and then I did the same thing eight more times. Back from the, the sequencer, we have 2.6 billion reads. So that is a lot of data to process. And it all comes back at once and you're really excited and you're like, okay, now it's time to work. Because not all of those reads are actually good quality. Some of them, you don't have good coverage or you might not have good confidence in your call. So you need to filter out for the really good uh, quality reads. Those reads, as I mentioned, are mapped to a particular reference genome, which we're using white spruce here. And then you call your SNP, so your differences across your samples. And I'm working with around 9,300 or 9,400 uh, SNPs in my data set. So uh, looking at the data, what do we see? And again, this is a first look at uh, do we see evidence of local adaptation uh, in the genome? So what I'm showing here is called a principal component analysis. And it sounds complicated, it kind of is complicated, but what this uh, statistical test does is it looks to see the variation or the structure in your data. And here what I'm showing is each dot is an individual, and each individual, remember, is made up of a set of SNPs or a set of base pairs. And so this PCA clusters individuals together that share a lot of the same genes, and it separates those individuals that don't share a lot of the same genes. So, in my opinion, we see very limited population structure, except we see this very clear divide in that first and that x-axis at the bottom, separating individuals from camel's hump and individuals from camel's hump and Mount Mansfield together. So there's around 120 or so individuals that are genetically different that are clustering out compared to everybody else. And I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. And then I said, okay, well, we see this clear separation in mountains. Let's look at the same graph and say, well, let's look at the elevations because that's what we're after. Are there elevational differences? And same thing. They cluster out. We don't really see any pattern here. And then I said, all right, well, let's zoom in. So let's zoom in on that left cluster that's, that was really long before, and now because we're zooming in, it's more scrunched together. Do we see any differences between the elevational gradients? And it doesn't look like it at first, but what I did was I took where each individual falls on that x-axis and said, are there differences between the groups? And we do find differences, but only for Mount Mansfield. So that's on this plot, we have elevation groups on the x-axis. We have our low, mid, and high represented by L, M, and H. And then we have that value on the y-axis where they fell along that climate or that space on the x-axis in the previous slide. And we see differences in, uh, genetically between low and mid uh, samples and low and high samples. So that's saying that the low elevation trees and juveniles on Mount Mansfield and Camel's Hump are different than the individuals at mid elevation and those low elevation samples are different than the high elevation samples or trees. This is very, there's a difference, but it's not very, uh, it's not a great difference. It's not statistically significant, but it's not like I'm looking at different species or really distinct clusters. So they're still sharing a lot of the genetic diversity, but there are enough to see small differences in the genome across the elevational gradient. So this leads me to camel's hump, and it's a bit of an enigma right now of, of what's going on. So going back to the previous slide, we don't see any differences between the elevational gradient uh, between, those, between the individuals. And we have this cluster on the right-hand side here, around 120 trees, uh, juveniles, and uh, seeds that we've grown from maternal trees. So we're just not sure what they are, but one thing that was pretty interesting is that if a maternal tree was collected and we have its genome sequenced and it falls in this right-hand cluster, so do the offspring. So that suggests something biological or genetically happening, where if 
the mom is on the, the right-hand side, so are the offspring, meaning that they're sharing more genetics than if they were on the other side. We're not sure what this is from. This is, uh, the, I've had the data for a little bit now, but these plots are not, um, they're still pretty fresh. Uh, and we're thinking that perhaps there were plantings of red spruce from somewhere else in the range. So perhaps they're from southern uh, portions of the range that are genetically distinguishable from that other part of the group. And we have ways to test this, but we're, we're still working on that uh, right now. Can you tell me if planting spruce is unusual in Vermont? I don't think it is. Um, there, so on Camel's Hump, I know there was Norway spruce planted, actually, after a fire, I believe. Uh, there was some at the low elevations and the high elevations. Um, as far as planting red spruce itself, I'm not sure. But I do know Norway spruce planted. Yeah, forester here, Charlie. <laughs> Does anyone ever plant red spruce? What's that? Does anyone ever plant red spruce? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Do you know from where? Uh, it would be a, a fairly local nursery, I would think. Mm -hmm. we, we planted more uh, red pine. This is way back. Red pine and white pine. Okay. Um, yeah, so the what I just showed you uh, is one way to look at evidence of adaptation. It's not a formal test of adaptation, but we can see that there's a lot of genetic diversity that's shared. And so the next steps for this particular part of the research is to look more formally at adaptation in the genome. So look at those single nucleotide polymorphisms or those SNPs those, and see if they vary or co-vary with differences in the climate or the temperature. So perhaps the frequency of the A allele that is associated with being able to withstand really cold climates increases as you move up the elevational gradient or as climate gets really colder. And perhaps the T allele confers some sort of advantage in the warmer environments and we see a higher frequency of the T allele uh, in that particular part of the, of the gradient as well. We have a few minutes before 11, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so that's looking at the genome. And as we know that there's some genetic variation, but a lot of it is shared. But what about in traits? Do we see any differences uh, in traits that could be ecologically uh, important with regard to climate? And we can ask the question, what portion of the uh, phenotype is under genetic control? And we do this, we ask this, or answer this question by using a common garden. And so think of this as collecting trees from across the gradient of Mount Mansfield, as we did, or cones rather, and growing all of the seedlings in one environment. So the environment is the same, it's stable, it's not changing. So if the environment's the same, and we see any differences in their phenotype, we know that that's because of their underlying genotype, or what their genome uh, variation is telling us based on this triangle here. So in doing this, again, we uh, use the seeds collected from the 48 maternal trees along both mountains and the elevational gradients. And we planted around 2,300 seeds in January of 2016. And of those, we had around 440 seedlings make it. So fun fact, don't treat seeds with ethanol. Um, it's really good. It sounds like no duh, but um, when you're trying to find out what seeds are filled or not see or not filled and which ones to plant and viable, uh, ethanol is a great way to do that, but it ends up uh, permeating the seed coat and damaging the seedling. So we've, in the literature, a lot of people say, oh yeah, it's fine, you can do that. And then when we did it, it didn't really work out all that well. Is that called getting drunk? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Canadians, I think, can get drunk a little better than we can because we tested Canadian seed and they didn't really have a problem. Some problems, but not as much as, as what we had. Um, so in our common garden, uh, we have a pretty proportional amount of uh, seedlings per elevation and mountain uh, grouping. So the first trait I looked at was onset of winter dormancy. So again, during the summer, we have active growth, the buds have flushed, the tree is growing, and then uh, 
towards fall, I would say, um, we start to have uh, set buds and the no more vegetative growth. I'm still trying to figure out when this actually happens here in Vermont because I seem to miss it every year naturally. Um, so I say fall, but I think in reality it might actually be like <laughs> mid-August, depending on, on where you are. But for us, growing or looking at them in the greenhouse, it was in the fall. And what we see is that there are differences in bud flush in such a way that would lead to adaptation of trees in their natural environments uh, along the gradient. So we found that there's some genetic control of this trait, which is important in order for uh, evolution and natural selection to work. And so on the plot here, elevation is on the x-axis, and we start with the low elevation seedlings on the left, and then we go towards the high elevation on the right. And the mean Julian day is just the time of uh, year that we recorded when the trees have set bud. And that brown scale was formed and no more growth was happening. And each point here represents uh, the mean of offspring of a maternal tree. So we have one tree and all of her offspring, and we average the time that her offspring set bud, and that goes into determining where this one point falls on this gradient. And we see that at high elevation, uh, the timing of bud set occurs earlier than at low elevation. So in our uh, look at this, we had about eight days difference from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. And it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but it could make or break the difference between uh, having cold damage or not being able to accumulate enough uh, capacity to withstand the really cold temperatures, which I'll touch upon in a minute. And so we saw a significant effect across the elevational gradient, like I said, and we really see that difference between low and high elevations rather than low and mid or mid and high. So in going off of that, we have cold tolerance, which I've kind of alluded to before. So winter injury, again, is that reddening and that hardening of the, of the needle tissue. And you don't have that problem if you're able to withstand the cold. And this ability to survive really plays a key role in a key adaptation of conifers living in the environments that they do. And so cold acclimation begins in the fall, and it's uh, largely uh, triggered by photo period or how long the days are. And then your cold tolerance, your ability to withstand really cold temperature, comes by actually experiencing lower temperatures yourself. So it's a multi-step process, but cold tolerance is what we uh, measured in this, in this uh, common garden. So we took a subset of our seedlings, and we took around four to six families, so four to six maternal trees per mountain and elevation grouping, and we had four seedlings per replicate, and we exposed them to artificial, artificial freeze tests. So this is a way um, that you can look at electrolyte leakage, which is a measure of how much the cell is damaged. And so when a cell becomes really cold, it lyses all of its contents, and that is what we're actually measuring. So in order to do this, this diagram here represents what we did for one individual seedling. You, again, chop up needles. You have an army of people chopping needles, and you put them in test tubes. And we subjected them to six different temperatures. Four degrees Celsius was our just control. And then all of the tubes went into minus three degrees Celsius. And this was done uh, in the uh, machine here on the, on the left. So you have all of your tissue at minus three degrees Celsius for two hours. And then you pull one tube out and measure how much of the cell has lysed or the electrolyte leakage. And then the remaining tubes go through the progressively colder and colder temperatures. So they all go through minus six for two hours. You pull out another test tube, minus nine, another test tube, minus 12, and minus 15. And then what you do at the end of all of this is you heat kill all of your samples. So you want to find out how much of the total, um, what's the total capacity that the cell can actually lice in the first place? What's the total amount of cell damage? And you take the amount of cell damage at a particular test temperature and compare it to the total amount to get how much that temperature actually did damage to the cell and to the plant. And similarly to uh, bud set, we see differences in our family and we see some con genetic control of the trait 
and that uh, electrolyte leakage or damage to the cell uh, increased as temperatures decreased, which is what we would expect. So as you go further along on this temperature gradient here on the x-axis, your damage starts to increase. And we see a difference in this damage based on where you came from. So if you're a low elevation seedling, you experienced more damage than you did if you were a cold elevation uh, seedling. And then again, looking at uh, the elevational differences, we see some difference between mountains or between elevations whenever you pull both Mount Mansfield and Camel's Hump together. But when you start to separate them out, we really only see a difference for Mount Mansfield, uh, but not Camel's Hump. So again, this leads to my thinking that something's going on with Camel's Hump that we're, that's muddling our signal of genetic differentiation between groups and also between the ability to pick up uh, differences in, in the traits. Okay, um, so to get into a second question that I have, um, this relates to the patterns of that dispersal and that gene flow um, within red spruce across the same elevational uh, gradients. So again, we're using genomics, um, but we're also partnering this work with uh, historical long-term monitoring of the forest around us, which some of us were recently uh, chatting about. So on Camel's Hump, we have this uh, forestry inventory that was started by Thomas Sycama in uh, 1964. So he was a graduate student in plant biology at the University of Vermont. And story has it that he was just wandering out in the woods and noticed that something was not right with red spruce and started to notice a lot of decline in the species. And he was, what he was interested in doing was setting up long, I don't know if he knew it at the time, but plots, permanent plots in the forest that can be monitored for many, many years. And so along this elevational gradient, uh, we have a total of 11 uh, stands, if you will, that follow the contour. And we have 85 plots, and in each of these plots, all tree species that are, again, greater than that two centimeter diameter breast height cutoff were recorded. So for nine different census years, starting in 1965, 1979, 1983, 86, 90, 95, 2000, 2004, and 2015, we have the um, species identity and how big they were at that given time. And the next census that we have is in 2020. Did you, did you see much of a change? Yes. You did? Over time? Yeah. yeah. So that change uh, can be summarized in a lot of different ways, but I picked four species to show here today in the distribution of these species. So with climate warming, we predict species will move upslope to track the, the warming temperatures and the climate. And we have different stories for each of these uh, kind of key players in the forest. So American beech is the only species that I've seen on Camel Slump actually move upslope. And we've seen that significant difference between 1965 and 1990 and again in 2015. So I'm showing here the distribution of each of these species in three kind of benchmark years. So we have American beech doing really well, increasing in abundance and moving upslope. Okay. Sugar maple, on the other hand, has stayed elevationally relatively stable, hasn't really shifted its range, but it is declining. And I can't see the numbers up here, but the numbers are um, pretty drastic. So in 1965, we had 401 observations go into creating this distribution. And in 2015, we only have 194, which is quite a remarkable difference. Um, and this isn't something that's unique to Camel's Hump. It's many accounts of sugar maple decline uh, across New England. I'll save red spruce for last. For balsam fir, we're seeing again no shift in the elevational range. It's already really high up in the mountain uh, and it's increased a little bit over time. Red spruce uh, is, an, is an oddball and I think what we're seeing here reflects that decline in that history that we were talking about earlier. So from 1965 to 1990, we see a decline in abundance. We start with around 200 individuals, and then we go all the way down to around 100 individuals between these two time periods. And we see a significant shift upslope in elevation, right? So what red spruce is doing at that time is just contracting to its core distribution around mid-elevation where it naturally is found. It's not being found in the lower elevations anymore. It's not being found 
at the very, very high peaks of the elevational gradient as well. In 2015, which was the last census, we're seeing an increase in abundance, and we're seeing that abundance happen in lower elevations, which means that the regeneration is actually coming up in elevations where it wasn't previously found for decades, and now we're starting to see it come back. And again, this isn't necessarily unique to red spruce. There are other reports of this as well. So what do you think the, the reason is for this? The reason, I think, um, could potentially be uh, twofold. One, if red spruce and sugar maple compete in the lower elevations and sugar maple is declining, then there are open resources that could be potentially available for other species to take advantage. <coughs> and perhaps that's red spruce. So that the decline of sugar maple could allow for red spruce to have ample resources. Why do they think the sugar maple is declining? So the sugar maple is affected by a few different things. One is it's not doing that well with the warming temperatures. The atmospheric deposition and the calcium depletion also impacted that species. So unlike red spruce that's on its rebound from that, I think sugar maple is still in decline from that. Um, I'm blanking on the name, but there's a uh, tent caterpillar. Yeah, those stressful. Uh, yeah. Um, gypsy, gypsy moths. Yeah, there's a lot of pest uh, problems as well. So I don't necessarily, necessarily think it's just climate as a problem for sugar maple. It's a combination of all these different factors. So I have a, I have a sugar maple in my yard. <clears throat> my wife told me to go up next to the house and it was just about like that. Mm -hmm. I planted it, and uh, it's now about, about that size. And uh, what I've done is I've given that wood ashes pretty frequently. It's doing very well. Mm -hmm. You can't see through it, though the leaves are big, so that so, so that could be a problem too. Yeah. yeah. And, and sugar maple require uh, the most nutrients. It's ash and sugar maple. Require the most nutrients of any trees. It's good to know. Yeah. What's the um, the so normal age of sugar maple versus um, red Ooh. red spruce? That's a good question. Um, I'm just I'm curious as whether that would be a factor as well. Whether they're just kind of aging, whether the sugar maple is aging, aging and and dying. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and looking at the we have the diameter of breast height for each of these trees. And if I remember correctly, it does seem like, and you know, you can think of that as age. Um, it does seem, you know what, I'm not sure. I don't want to speak incorrectly. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. In relation to <clears throat> pest damage, could climate be an indirect factor in making it more hospitable to certain pests? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then another point that goes into this is the past logging. So it wasn't like red spruce was never found in low elevations. It was once there. But at the turn of the century, you started logging it. So it's not that it can't survive in those in, in environments and those habitats and climate, um, but we just removed it. So it's kind of like a recolonization of where it once was. It's odd that it's also not kind of staying put or removing upslope, but I think it's you know, the combination of sugar maple decline as well as the logging, the land use history that is allowing us to see this response. So I think this goes to show very nicely that it's pretty complex when you're trying to understand how species are going to respond to climate change because it's never just climate per se. There's always a lot of other factors that contribute to, to their response. So this is what we've seen and the, over a relatively short time period, so 50 years. Um, and we're seeing this in this movement and this dispersal, but what does the long-term trend actually look like? What is the historical pattern of gene movement on the mountain? Do we see it moving? Uh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, so what's this long-term trend? And can we use the genome and the variability in the genome to parse out what's happened thousands and thousands of years ago, and also what's happening right now. We're lucky that we have this long-term monitoring data set, but we can also use the genome to look at differences and variations to parse out these two different scales or these inferences of where the genes are moving. 
And I won't go into the nitty gritty details of how this actually works um, with the statistical test, but we can use the established trees, so the adult trees, to look at what happened thousands of years ago and what are the patterns of gene flow. And I'll show you a few hypotheses that we have. And we're using these trees because they're less likely to be impacted by a very recent movement. Whereas the seedlings and the really young trees underneath the canopy likely reflect this downslope movement that we're seeing. And we can do what's called something like a paternity test to see, well, where do you actually belong? Where do your genes come from? We might not know the exact tree, but we can at least use the genome to find a relative location. With the long-term historical data, uh, there's a few models that we can test. So the first is that gene flow is more or less random, and it's happening across the entire elevational gradient in all directions. So gene flow moves from low to high, high to low, and every combination in between. And again, this is through pollen uh, and seeds, with pollen, of course, traveling longer distance than the seeds were. We can have another model that looks that uh, says gene flow follows the upslope wind movements and has been asymmetrical. So this is just a low to high uh, migration of pollen. And then finally, we can ask, well, is gene flow been uh, density dependent? Meaning the core of red spruce's range on elevational gradient is around mid elevation, around 800. And it doesn't do really well. It doesn't survive at the very top of the mountain. And it's not very likely found at the very bottom of the mountain, although we, we do sometimes see it in both extremes. So in this core of its mountain range, or of the elevational range, is gene flow kind of just bubbling out of that mid-elevation. And we're able to use the genome to look at origins of ancestry, of where the DNA actually uh, came from. So in getting at this idea and this balance between having a lot of gene movement and dispersal and adaptation in the genome, I've talked a lot about climate being a selective agent to say, okay, you're not, uh, you don't have the phenotype to survive in this area, so you're not going to make it. But there are also biological mechanisms that can prevent uh, gene flow from completely overwhelming the possibility of adaptation. And one is the timing of reproduction. So when pollen is released um, on the gradient or along the elevational gradient. And what I propose to do and what we've started to do is use field observations and genomics to look at when pollen is actually being released on the mountain. So uh, as a cartoon here, I have the day of year pollen release on the X axis and then the amount of pollen on the Y axis here. And so, we can have pollen being contributed to the landscape at any point in time across this entire range of, say, days that I have here. But the contributors, those trees that are actually making the pollen and contributing to that pollen cloud, can differ. So perhaps trees at low elevation have their peak pollen release before high elevation trees do, and high elevation trees put all of their pollen out after low elevation. We might find some overlap, which is kind of what I would expect, but we might be able to quantify how much overlap there is and tease apart this difference of, is there enough difference in when high elevation trees are putting out their pollen and low elevation trees putting out their pollen that they're not likely to actually fertilize the cones that aren't necessarily around them. So we started this study in spring of 2017. Uh, this was a lot of uh, field work involved with this. So for every day or every other day for about a little over a month we went uh, to Mount Mansfield and made phenological observations of when pollen was being released. So we chose trees along the entire gradient where we could see the pollen cones, uh, whether they're open or closed, whether we can actually touch them and uh, get pollen to be released. And then another key indicator were actually the female cones. So those um, turn a shade of really bright pink to really dark purple, and then they close off, and then they're like a green-brown color. And we were able to use both of those to help infer uh, in the field what the phenology or the timing of the pollen release was. Because the female cones are going to be open when that pollen is being released in that area, and they're going to close when they sense that there's not a lot of pollen. Of course, temperature regulates that as well. And then we also established uh, airborne sampling methods. So 
For this, we used our low and our high elevation sites on Mount Mansfield, and we used a rotation impaction sampler, which equates to a little bar and you have on like a stake, and you have little greased rods that come down on either side, and they spin around for one minute over and over every day. And we got, based on how much pollen we were getting, we had to remove the rods every single day and put new rods in. So you have this clear glass rod, or I shouldn't say glass, um, clear rod with grease on it, and anything that's in the air at that point in time in that environment gets stuck to that rod. So that includes spruce pollen, maple, birch. Pick your favorite tree in the area. It's likely to be on this rod. So our original plan was to use a microscope and to look at the pollen grains and identify spruce from other species. Um, and what this often involves is you have your sample, your rod, and then you have a, a diagram that is a pure red spruce. So you're able to match up and say, this is a red spruce it could, because it looks like this picture. Um, and then we would use the abundance data, or the number of grains on each sampling rod for each site and day to infer when the pollen release was happening. Well, as you can see with the photos on the left, spruce pollen looks a lot like pine pollen as well as fir. And it takes experts in order to actually tell the difference. And we're, have a, we have a confounding factor because the grease puts the pollen grains in all sorts of different orientations. So it's an absolute mess trying to figure out what this actually means. <coughs> So we're using genomics to help answer this question. And it's a process called pollen DNA metabarcoding. So it's similar to what I've talked to, uh, talked to you about before. But we're using this now to identify plant species uh, based on the sequences in their, in their DNA. So again, we extract the DNA. We make our pollen soup. And we find a region in the genome that is conserved among plant species. And this region has to be conserved enough that a lot of the trees in the area, for example, will have this. But this region also has to have enough mutations or differences within it that we can tell species apart. And sometimes we can only do this based on genera, sometimes it's on family. But the database is becoming uh, so robust that we're able to tell different species apart. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. So then you sequence the fragments and then you use your sequences in a database to match up and figure out who are their players in your sample of that particular day and time. So what does this look like for us? It's, it's hard to see, but on, and that's our, um, our collection of pollen on our little, on our little rods. Uh, and it's just covered in like a yellow dust. That's, that's what it looks like. And so we're in the process now of figuring out how to extract the DNA from the pollen. It's a quite tricky process where for each rod in there that corresponds to either a lower high elevation on any particular day, you attach your ID to it. So at the end, you know where your pollen came from. And then we chose a particular part of the genome that's called ITS2. And this is a region in between, um, it's called the internal transcribed spacer region. Uh, it's on ribosomal DNA. And what's important about it is that we're able to tell different species in the area apart from one another. So I've highlighted just one little section of what this actually looks like of, of this region. So sugar maple, we see its string of uh, nucleotides or base pairs. And anywhere that there is a dash, it means that it's not in the genome. So red sugar maple has that first stretch, then that G and the T comes right next to the C. And then the AG is right next to the A. So there's actually not spaces in the genome. It's just all put together. Balsam fir and red spruce. So anywhere where you see an asterisk, it means that the base pair, the nucleotide, is exactly the same letter across our samples. Anywhere where there's not an asterisk, that means there's some difference between those three species. And we can use this variability to figure out what proportion of our DNA is red spruce. And then the number of sequences that we get back on any given day help us infer when pollen release actually happened. So we went from counting the number of grains to using the number of gene, uh, genome sequences that we get back on any given day to answer this question. And then finally, um, 
the last, the last bit of uh, my dissertation work deals directly with you know, this potential mismatch with climate change. Again, trees are really long lived. They can't just, you know, get up and move. So we're in this scenario now where the warm environment that we were in before with our yellow trees becomes hot. And this is an extreme case, but then that cold environment at the tops just becomes warm. And so how are trees actually going to um, respond to this? And what are the, the levels that or what's the possibility that trees can actually adapt or migrate largely remains unknown. So for this particular part of my dissertation, I'm not using genomics at all. I can use genomics to help me, but I don't actually need genomics to uh, answer these questions. So I'm interested in asking what's the spatial scale at which the loss of adaptation to climate occurs? And I'll, that should become a bit more clear in a moment. And then what is the magnitude of reduction in performance under a given change in climate. So if you, um, let's say you grow to be so many centimeters tall when it's five degrees Celsius, how tall do you grow whenever it's now seven degrees Celsius, if you're a tree that comes from the top of the mountain? And we'll be able to tell, we'll actually be able to put numbers to uh, those scenarios. To do this, I'm using a space for time reciprocal transplant approach, which again is a mouthful, but what this looks at is it's testing the idea of the home field advantage. Again, this idea of local adaptation, where the trees that are grown in their native environment are going to do best compared whenever they're transplanted to a different environment. So we take trees that were at the top of the mountain and we put them in the bottom, and then we put trees at the bottom of the mountain and we put them at the top. I like to think of it as putting someone in Florida dressed for Florida weather up here in Vermont as they are right now, and someone in Vermont as we are dressed right now in Florida, and seeing how well we do without being able to change the clothes we're wearing or anything like that. So we do this reciprocal transplant, and it's called a space for time because we're using the elevational gradient as a way or as a proxy for time. So moving the cold adapted trees and the mid-elevation trees to the warmer elevations we don't need to speed up climate change, right? We can just say, okay, well, if it's going to potentially be this warm in 50, 60 years, we can just move them down the mountain to simulate that rather than waiting. What size trees are you transplanting? They're seedlings. So, uh, yay tall as of now. They're growing in the greenhouse. <laughs> uh, so to do this, to compare the spatial scale, the loss of adaptation, we, I've, um, I'm using the same uh, elevational gradient on Mount Mansfield. I've collected different seed families for this. And then I'm also collecting, or we've also collected uh, seed from across the entire range of red spruce. So we have a very fine spatial scale across Mount Mansfield, and we have a very broad spatial scale, say from uh, Tennessee to New Brunswick. But what I did here was, because I'm planting them here in Vermont and on, on Mount Mansfield, I wanted to match the climate space, right? So what was the temperature at the top of Mount Mansfield and what's the temperature at the lowest point that I collected on Mount Mansfield? And then find that similar range, that similar climate range in the actual geographical range of red spruce. And so for me, that falls between somewhere New Brunswick to maybe Maryland when we have collections. So I have 30 trees from Mount Mansfield that I collected seed from, and I picked 30 trees from across the range that climatically match, but geographically differ in how much space is between their populations or the individual trees. And why this matters is, again, remember gene flow, mixing up that genetic pull. When we're on that, this elevational gradient, we expect a lot of gene flow. We see evidence of that. But whenever you're collecting from across the range, genes aren't going to be able to move from North Carolina to Maryland to Pennsylvania to Vermont and so forth. So you're likely to see more evidence of adaptation across the entire range than you are locally. And I want to be able to test that to help inform uh, conservation efforts and, you know, I think it lends some insight into what is the appropriate scale of seed movement. Where do we actually see adaptation? How strong is that adaptation? And I'm not going to propose any answers to those right now, but I think it's you know, worth having a discussion of what do we, in conservation and restoration efforts, what are our goals? 
and what future are we planning for? And I think this can lend some insight to answering those questions. So just to uh, reiterate what I said before, it's hard to see, but I collected uh, red spruce on Mount Mansfield. Uh, the toll road on Mount Mansfield has been my friend. I don't know if any of you have driven up there, but there's a sticker that says this car has made it up Mount Mansfield or something like that. And I probably could insert like 150 times uh, through all the work that I've done on the toll road. So I use that as a huge advantage to collecting cones. And then as part of a different grant uh, in the lab, we have collections across the range and the points highlighted in the black are where the climate space, space matches what's on uh, Mount Mansfield. And then as I previously mentioned, the seedlings are growing right now in the greenhouse at UVM. They're about this tall. Uh, and what I'm going to do this uh, spring in just a few months are build uh, raised bed common gardens. So that's an example in that bottom picture, but I'll just have one of them. And I'll make each of these at a low elevation site, so Proctor Maple Research Center, uh, a mid elevation site in Underhill State Park, and then at the very top summit of uh, Mount Mansfield. So it's gonna be a lot of work to actually build these beds, fill them with soil and gravel, and then plant around 400 seedlings from across both gradients in the same environment. And then measure traits such as um, biomass, how tall they grow, how cold tolerant they are when they start their growing season and, and when they start. And all that data will go into informing um, how adapted these trees are and at what gradient. How many years do you anticipate this? this? I will have them there until the end of 2020 um, because that's when my dissertation ends. But depending on, right now I have permission to do this and it's, it's from the state. Um, and I have to remove them. But if before I remove them, I'm going to each person I contacted to get permission to, to see if they're interested in leaving it on as public access or experimental, experimental gardens. So in a uh, very brief summary, uh, we don't see a lot of genetic uh, differences between red spruce across the entire elevational gradient. They share a lot of the same genome and genetic variability, which is what we would expect. Um, but we do see that ev evidence that some traits are fine-tuned to the, the climate space, even at such a small spatial scale as Mount Mansfield. Um, as we talked about here and you know, also during the break, red spruce has a complicated short-term history with a lot of decline and a uh, recent recovery. And we're using genomics to unravel both evolutionary processes as well as biological processes to help um, infer the distribution of red spruce not only in the past but what we see now and then potentially implications for um, the future. So I have uh, many people to uh, thank. My funding is through the USDA uh, Hatch Grant and the University of Vermont. Uh, my committee members on my, uh, for my uh, dissertation, Stephen Keller is my advisor, who, that's whose lab I'm in and a slew of uh, other people who have made this work possible. So thank you. I know we've been chatting along the way, but I'm happy to take more questions. So is, are other people doing research similar to this using other species in other parts of the country or the world? Yes, yep. Um, balsam poplar is one of the major tree species uh, that people study. There's a lot of work done out west on different spruce um, looking at, again, climate adaptation, but a lot of the research on trees is done at very broad spatial scales. And uh, recently I have read a lot of papers looking at hybrids between different species and how that can impact uh, climate change. When it comes to fine scale gradients, like I've heavily focused on, it's mainly species that the dispersal capacity is, is shorter or smaller and that there's, it's not likely to have plants move, or pollen or seed move across the entire gradient. So trees, you know, in doing this, there's a lot of benefits of doing it in red spruce, but asking this question in trees, I think, uh, can lend a lot of insight to just what happens. Along that same line, how much international collaboration exists 
and this type of forestry research. I know in mammalian uh, <coughs> genomics, for example, there's a very active international network mm -hmm. across all the continents. Is mm -hmm. this true with forest species as well? Uh, that I'm not sure, actually. I, I don't have a good answer for that. And I know that uh, we've had a few uh, visiting scientists come to the lab from different countries asking similar questions. But I don't know a lot of um, networks, if you will, of that are already put into place for forestry. Well, in the Keller lab, it's quite international. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and, and Steve's doing a new project looking at red spruce across its entire range and asking questions about uh, where the populations were, uh, you know, during thousands of years ago and where they've migrated over time and how the population sizes have grown and shrunk or, or and decreased and, and that sort of thing. And to do that, he's using um, pollen records or sediment cores and extracting DNA from the pollen. And he has a collaborator in Sweden, I believe. And so there is collaboration within individual groups, of course, particularly ours. Uh, but there's not, a, I don't know of a network, uh, so to say. Can you suggest how this research might be applied to help red spruce deal with climate change? I think, um, ultimately, I think what I would like to see is the incorporation of genetics and genomics into understanding if we're going to plant seeds, where should they come from? Um, a lot of work done now um, uses seed zones, for example, but those seed zones parse up the landscape in such a way that might be characterized based on ecological processes or forest community types or climate without actually looking at the variation within a particular species. Um, so I would, if someone's going to plant red spruce in the future to adapt to you know, climate change or help the species adapt to climate change, I would hope that they were able to look at some of the genetic variability that I find, important traits, and what scale we see this adaptation into consideration in doing that work. One more question. Yeah, yeah. And thinking about all of your planting of seeds from different parts of the spruce range, are there likely to be different mycorrhizal associations and different parts of the range that's complicated? I always get this question, actually. Um, yes, I, I'm sure there are, but we are taking, naturally, I think there are, um, even across the elevational gradient. But because we're taking them from seed and growing them all in the same media and then all in the same uh, common garden with the same soil, we're eliminating that factor altogether. So it's something to take into consideration that uh, that could influence also what we're seeing, that not having that native uh, community there, but by trying to standardize things as much as we can and looking at just the impacts of climate, we're keeping it standard. What are you going to tell, talk about with the uh, uh, junior high students at Jefferson School this afternoon? Largely how, um, so I'm not talking about genetics at all actually, um, but more how forest communities are just impacted by climate change in general. And I plan to talk about the four different species that I showed, red spruce, balsam, or balsam fir, um, American beech, uh, sugar maple, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, balsam fir. I thought I said balsam poplar. I'm losing it. Um, just how they're doing over time. and. Uh, trying to get them to understand the concept that trees can't move and they're stuck in the place that they were born and how are they actually going to, you know, persist in, a, in an environment that the climate's changing pretty rapidly. We'll be anxious to have a brief report. <laughs> and that was enough. How, how that goes with the students yeah. and, and their reactions. Just out of curiosity, what happens um, to the trees that are greenhouse grown after the experiment's done? So, unfortunately they died, okay. um, but not because we wanted them to. Uh, we had them in the greenhouse, so we moved them outside of our building on UVM campus. And because it was just so hot this summer, they got scorched. 
and the needles, um, I felt like it happened overnight. They just turned completely brown and, and disintegrated off. So it wasn't planned, but yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you ever planted them in the wild after an experiment like that. Uh, yeah, I've never, I've never planted them. I've given a few out as gifts to people. <laughs> um, whether or not I should or should not do that, I, there's some in Pennsylvania right now. Um, but yeah. Um, you said that the that American beach was moving up in elevation. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, uh, ideas about why that's happening, whether it's because of seed dispersal or roots or what? Um, other than seed dispersal, I'm not really sure, and I and I beech is a species that I don't know that much about, um, especially with beech bark disease, and I don't know how. I know it's prevalent here, but I, I am a bit surprised that we're seeing beech increase and also move up slope um, when that is also an issue at the same time. Beech bark disease hit very hard back in the. In the early 60s, I've been uh, say the higher elevations here. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all over now. Is it still uh, prevalent, or do you think it's? Well, I mean, has it gotten it worse? I'm assuming it's gotten worse. The higher elevations but. look like ghost forests because they died. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it's still here, and it's still going. Okay. I wasn't sure earlier when you were talking about um, the calcium deficiency mm -hmm. that was causing the needles to be brittle. Mm -hmm. I missed what the cause, the initial cause of the calcium deficiency was. The initial cause is when um, basically, basically the acidification of the soils, changing the chemistry, um, and calcium tends to be leached away, and therefore trees can't take it up as much or as readily as they need to, and then whatever stores they have, they're not able to replenish. And so it's, it's something that can, you know, happen in a given year even, but with, you know, atmospheric pollution, it's, it's a long-term effect and there's just not enough calcium to make the membranes of the cells really stable to withstand essentially like uh, water freezing within them and piercing through the, the cell walls. I'm interested in uh, <clears throat> your impressions about funding sources. Mm -hmm. How much of it is industry driven versus uh, government driven or uh, NGO driven? And is this changing with, uh, for example, the acid rain thing mm -hmm. uh, versus climate change thing and so on? A lot of our funding uh, comes through NSF and the USDA. I National Science, Foundation. National, no, National Science Foundation. I think over time um, we might see a shift in, you know, funding for. I mean, all species uh, can have an ecological function and a role, but not every species is economically important. And I think that might change how funding is sourced with climate change and where we actually see where we need the research, where we need the money. And if we're able to use genomics in such a way to look at particular uh, genes, if you will, that affect traits that can uh, improve biofuels or improve crops and how long they grow and where they grow and those sorts of things, um, we might see a shift in the funding that way. I think I personally am still early on in my career where Funding's there and grants are there and to be had, but I'm not actively applying, so um, that might be my naive uh, answer to that question. But yeah, I think we might see a shift.